Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to anyone joining us today. My name is Alan Dominguez, and on behalf of the International Dysphagia Diet Standardization Initiative, I'd like to welcome you all to today's webinar titled ITSI 301 Implementation. We would like to thank our very generous sponsors who allow the work of ITSI to continue and who support implementation around the world. So before we begin, I just want to go through some quick housekeeping. The webinar is being recorded and it will be available on our website and on our YouTube channel early next week. All participants who are joining us today are in listen-only mode, which means that the panelists will not hear or see you and that your microphone and your video will remain off for the session. However, if you have any questions, you can submit them throughout the presentation and to do so, you can use the Q&A button on the middle of your menu bar at the bottom or the top of your screen and the panelists will then address these questions at the end of the presentation when we will have about 15 to 20 minutes for a Q&A period. ITSI doesn't currently offer continuing education units, but in the upcoming days, a certificate of attendance will be emailed to anyone attending the session via a computer. So if you're joining us on the phone, please email us at meetings at IDDSI to let us know who you are so we can email you the certificate. Again, if you're joining us on the computer, there is no need to get in touch with us. You will receive the certificate automatically. Uh, that is it for housekeeping. So joining us on this webinar as guests are Sophie Palmer and John Hallahan, who are members of the Canadian IDDSI Expert Reference Group and the presenters of the IDDSI 101 and 201 webinars, respectively, as well as Peter Lamb, who is the co-chair of the ITSI Board of Directors. And last but not least, it's my pleasure to introduce our main presenter for today, Ellen Andrews. Ellen is a bilingual speech language pathologist at St. Vincent Hospital Bruyere Continuum Care in Ottawa, Ontario. Bruyere's programs include complex continuing care, rehabilitation, palliative care, and long-term care. She is a graduate of the University of Toronto and a lecturer at the University of Ottawa. Ellen has spent her career working with adults with complex communication and swallowing issues, and she led a team that implemented the International Dysphagia Diet Standardization Initiative at her multi-site organization in 2017. Uh, Ellen, we are so thrilled to have you. Uh, so welcome, and please go ahead. Thank you so much for the lovely introduction, and welcome to all of our participants today. Very glad to, to see you're already sharing a bit of our passion for IDSI, and I hope this presentation today will be of great use to you as you look to implement IDSI at your facilities. So this presentation will focus today on how to implement the International Dysphagia Diet Standardization Initiative. It is third in a series of Canadian presentations offered in May 2020. The first two presentations, IDSI 101, which outlines the framework, and IDSI 201, which provides more detailed teaching on the texture testing methods, as Alan said, can be accessed through the IDSI YouTube channel. So in this presentation today, I will review the suggested process for IDSI implementation and will offer some practical tips from my own experiences. I had the pleasure of implementing IDSI at our adult complex continuing care hospital and I'm um, hoping my practical experiences will be useful for you today. And of course, I'm speaking through my, my lens as a clinician. However, we're really fortunate to have the other panelists available to help answer your questions uh, from the Canadian IDSI Expert Reference Group if they're of a more technical nature. Well, I'm not sure if the term IDSI expert is apt in my case. I'm an absolute IDSI enthusiast and I'm sure my great appreciation for this framework will shine through today. The International Dysphagia Diet Standardization Initiative would like to acknowledge these wonderful sponsors for their continued support. IDSI is an international not-for-profit made up of volunteers. Industry has had no input into the development of the framework, publications, or resource materials. IDSI adoption in Canada is broadly supported by a number of professional associations, as well as the universities and industry. MAPA, monitor, aware, prepare, adopt. This is the broad concept model for IDSI implementation. The IDSI framework and descriptors have been widely shared for several years now. So I hope at this time that all of you, our participants today, are somewhat familiar with the IDSI framework and rationale 
This presentation will focus on the prepare and adopt phases. We'll walk you through the series of tools and resources to support a successful transition to IDSI in your care setting. So these are the steps for successful transition to IDSI, and I hope many of you discover as we go through the presentations today that you may already be further along than you thought in your IDSI process. So your first steps, of course, are to become familiar with the IDSI framework. And I believe you may already have started to become a champion for IDSI in your setting. We'll then look at how to form an IDSI implementation team, determining what your tasks and timelines will be for a successful IDSI implementation, educating those who need to understand about the IDSI process, mapping your foods and drinks, and ensuring great clinical communication. So we know why we are here. As practitioners who are familiar with dysphagia, we know the risks it can pose. Speaking from my personal experiences, I know I was so ready for IDSI when it finally arrived. I work in a complex continuing care hospital, which means all that of our patients come to us from other healthcare centers. This means lots of risks at points of care transition. So when I started my career, we had a truly Byzantine diet texture system. It was made up of eight distinct diet textures, dysphagic and regular versions of pureed, minced, solid, soft, and regular. So this meant we actually had a diet called dysphagic puree, which was different than puree, and a diet called dysphagic regular, which was different than regular. Um, there was a checklist that document, document that outlined the foods on all these different textures, but this was quote unquote owned by a particularly uh, possessive dietitian who guarded it very closely. None of us were quite sure of the rationale behind the diet systems, and often we came, became quite attached to a diet that made sense to us. My go-to became this one called dysphagic soft. It was made up of soft and minced items and didn't contain bread. Eventually, all the local hospitals got together and decided to use the same names for our menu items, terms like soft and minced. However, the problem is this quality project did not progress to include using the same definitions. This meant that until IDSI, we had to jokingly put through our, our patients through what we would call our secret dysphagia diet decoder ring. It went something like this. Their minced diet is a lot more like our soft diet, so I think this patient should be on a soft diet. Even our own diets were super confusing. The diet we called minced had a bunch of stuff on it that wasn't minced at all, including really solid items like our legendarily rock hard toast. So if I wanted to, write, to recommend that a patient get minced food, I literally had to write a diet order that said, send only minced food on the minced diet. The diets weren't at all intuitive and they were completely ripe for error. Let's see the confusion this can lead to. The comments on this slide were taken from some social media discussion groups frequented by clinicians familiar with dysphagia. What they highlight is the difficulties an interpretation can pose. When we don't share robust, consistent definitions of food and drink consistencies, then there's a lot of risk. Imagine a person with dysphagia moving from a facility that wouldn't allow an item on a pureed diet, like the large cur curd cottage cheese on the bottom left, to a facility that would. The clinicians who wrote these posts were struggling with how to promote safety when everybody's idea of what is acceptable was different. When there aren't clear and consistent definitions for food and drink textures, it can lead to conflict. We all want what is best for the people with dysphagia we serve. We want to ensure their safety while promoting their quality of life. Starting with a consistent model, plan, and vocabulary really aids in the achievement of these goals. In my training, I was never trained on the term mechanical soft, and I've always been confused by it. What is the definition of mechanical or of soft? Is it different than dental soft? Does everyone use these terms the same way? Would these terms be obvious to someone I was trying to explain them to or teach? What I love about the social media post in particular that is how it finishes. Do you have any recommendations for me? And why, yes, we do. Enter IDSI. Safety through common terminology for all ages, all care settings, all cultures. 
this is the primary objective of the International Dysphagia Diet Standardization Initiative. Here's a video fluoroscopy show, of study showing that the swallows of thin liquids. This is a dramatic example of the uncontrolled descent of the liquid into the airway, leading to gross aspiration. What is remarkable in this video fluoroscopy is that the bolus in question is actually a piece of jealous. Notice that it was not broken apart in the oral phase and ended up in the pharynx as an obstructive solid. As a clinician, when I see someone with compromised oral processing skills, I want to make sure that the food they receive is appropriately texture modified so this doesn't happen. We need to ensure that foods are modified to the correct texture and consistently labeled to prevent this kind of tragedy. So my professional background is speech language pathology, but I think all of us today who are at all concerned with dysphagia can relate to the gaspiration when we watched those videos just now. The ITSI framework was developed over several years. National standards were examined. The research literature was reviewed. There was extensive global consultation with over 2,000 stakeholders, and all of this led to the development of the framework. So it's a framework we can feel very, very confident in adopting because we know it was made with um, good scientific understanding and, and broad-based support. And what's really special about the framework is that it continues to be a living document that will grow and change as our research or our, our clinical knowledge progresses, progresses. For instance, a subcategory of level seven regular called easy to chew was added to the framework after user feedback saying that a softer way to classify softer foods um, on the regular diet for those with milder challenges was required. These are the key characteristics of the IDSI framework. It's evidence-based. And if that's something you'd like to know more about, I would really encourage you to look uh, for the IDSI of publications list, which is under the general resources tab at idsi.org. IDSI framework is broadly supported. It's designed to be internationally and interculturally inclusive. It provides a common language to discuss dysphagia diets. It gives strong operational definitions for each texture. It provides testing protocols using only simple, cost-effective, quick, and easy-to-use techniques and tools. And it highlights the relationships between the different diet textures. Together, these features provide many reasons to feel confident about IDSI adoption. They can be powerful selling points as you advocate for IDSI adoption in your care setting. It is indeed a best practice. Here's our IDSI diet pyramids, the upper one being the foods and the lower one being the drinks. And what's really important to understand is the IDSI scale is descriptive. Now, what does this mean? The ITSI scale describes categories of foods and drinks that have similar characteristics in terms such as cohesiveness, hardness, particle size, and flow. A clinical evaluation determines which textures of foods and drinks can be safely managed for a person with dysphagia. Using the ITSI testing methods, anyone can quickly determine if a given food item possesses the right characteristics. Now, most of us take foods and drinks across the whole texture spectrum and many foods can be presented as many textures. For instance, beef can come as a regular steak, a soft and bite-sized stew, a minced and moist ground casserole, a pureed pate, a liquidized blended soup, or a thin broth. Milk could be found as a thin drink, a moderately thick milkshake, an extremely thick pudding, or a regular piece of cheese. So a diet would never prescribe that you can have beef or milk but would rather describe the texture you can tolerate, and then you can identify the foods and drinks that have those texture characteristics. Now, persons with dysphagia often take a narrower band of the food and drink pyramid. So in this red box today is my, my patient with dysphagia. I have assessed this person, and I found that this person has the oral processing skills to mean that they can tolerate foods that are at the mince and moist level, but also even softer ones such as purees. This person can manage slightly thick drinks, but also thicker ones. 
The texture characteristics of the items outside the red box have been determined in my clinical assessment to be unsafe for this person with dysphagia to manage. Using the ITZY pyramids can be very, a very helpful guide. Also, if you're considering if, if the person with dysphagia with, you, who, with whom you're working is either improving or deteriorating. If my, my person with dysphagia is getting better, perhaps the, the next logical place to explore would be the soft and bite-sized diet. But if they're having increased difficulties over time, maybe the pureed diet will be the way to go next. The second step of IDSI implementation is to gather your team. Now, depending on your setting, it may involve many people for a successful IDSI project. The core, setting, core team at my care setting was me, a speech language pathologist, a registered dietitian, the manager of our food services department, and our patient menu coordinator. Our organization recognized the importance of this project with a commitment to quality award. And there we are receiving our award. What I love about this photo is all of the people surrounding us. You'll notice that it is most, almost all of our entire food services department who are amazing allies throughout the whole process. It's really important to gather a team that combines clinical dysphagia expertise with the practical systems and process knowledge of those who will help purchase or prepare the foods. It may also be important to consider team members who can support transitioning your terminology for documentation or your staff education. Regional teams can, can create momentum, allow for mutual support and problem solving, and can be really helpful to get leadership buy-in. We were fortunate to be joined by all the local hospitals in the second year of our project. We met face-to-face -face quarterly and knew we can consult with each other by phone or email whenever we needed to. We were able to share our tips, triumphs, and challenges. It was particularly helpful for some of our local IDSI advocates who found themselves with less supportive and enthusiastic administrators and dietary departments. When everyone else in the region was on board with IDSI, it was very hard for reluctant administrators to ignore or resist what was clearly a best practice. The third step of IDSI implementation is the planning. On the idsi.org site, you will find three implementation guides, one for each key sector, food services, clinicians, and industries. Although the guides look lengthy, they aren't at all intimidating. Here's the first page of the cross-section master guide. You already have likely completed the first steps and may be well on your way to the second. The guides are a good way for a team to identify the factors that will need to be addressed in their IDSI implementation projects and then their next steps. It can be a great way to keep you on task and on timeline. Every setting will have unique challenges when implementing IDSI. That's why you're encouraged to build an implementation team made up of champions from all the different domains that will be affected by this change in your organization. The drivers in, for IDSI implementation vary, and so can the timelines. In my region, IDSI projects ran from about three months to about three years. So, first question you might want to ask yourself is, do you already have enthusiastic IDSI champions identified? And I hope all of you participating today are already those champions in your work settings. Do you have buy-in from leadership? Do you have, um, are you mandated to implement IDSI, perhaps on a certain timeline? Perhaps uh, you have some sort of regulatory driver or this is an accreditation project for you. And does this project need to dovetail with other priorities in your organization? So speaking from my own experiences, at our organization, we were stuck for about 18 months waiting for a software upgrade that just kept getting postponed. This meant that we had to change the characteristics of our diet to the INZ standard, but we're still using the old names. So for a while, our diet wasn't called level five minced and moist. It was just still called minced, but it was in effect an actual IDSI diet that had all of those characteristics. Another local healthcare organization decided to switch their entire electronic medical record to a new vendor. Their IDSI champions realized that now was the moment to adopt the IDSI standards so that the terminology could be built right into the medical record from the day it launched. As such, their process went forward very, very quickly. Will you have budgeted or dedicated time for your project? I didn't have any dedicated time when I led our IG project, but I was fortunate to have a relatively flexible schedule and a very, very accommodating team. 
Do you want to do a full cold turkey idzy transition or it's something you think you might implement more gradually? It's important to realize that the whole IDSI framework can be implemented step by step versus all at once. Some steps may even be quite simple for you. For instance, if you're using commercially prepared to thicken liquids, they likely already have IDSI labeling on them at this point. Maybe an easy switch to just start using that terminology in your care setting. You may also find that you have at least two easy wins for food textures. Obviously, regular food maps seamlessly to level seven regular diet. And even many pureed items you already serve, as long as they aren't too sticky or thick, may already correspond very well to the level four pureed diet. Even the level five minced and moist diet may be pretty straightforward. Take away the things that aren't actually minced or moist and then check your particle size. Voila, you've just idzicized most of your menu. The depth of understanding and involvement of different players will depend a lot on the particularities of your care setting. That's why we can't give you precise suggestions about exactly who needs to be involved in your team. In my setting, our food and drinks are all commercially sourced, so it was really wonderful to have our patient menu coordinator on the core team. If you're in a setting where you're preparing your own foods and drinks, you're going to have to make sure your chefs and recipe developers really understand the types of texture characteristics for the foods you're preparing. Here's some examples of commercially available dysphagia products that are already using IZZY terminology on their labels. The fourth step of IZZY implementation is spreading the word. Adopting IZZY is an opportunity to do a best practice. Because the testing methods are so simple and the available resource materials are so complete, it is a quality project that can be managed by teams with different levels of experience. The more that sites implement IDSI, the harder it becomes for others in the healthcare continuum to avoid it. IDSI can make care transitions for vulnerable people with dysphagia so much safer. One trick we adopted early on was very, very intentionally using the IDSI language in our discharge reports. We knew that at first many of the local hospitals and long-term care homes to which our patients transitioned were not IDSI adopters. We challenged them to use the model if they wanted to understand the diet texture recommendations we were making. We would, have, we would even attach pages of the IDSI framework or the consumer handouts to our reports if we wanted them to truly understand what we meant by terms like level six, soft and bite-sized. And we constantly offered to answer any questions or support any team that wanted to implement IDSI. The time this took wasn't overwhelming, and help us own our superpowers as dysphagia experts and advocates. And now comes the absolute most fun part of IDSI implementation, mapping the foods and drinks. I don't think I have ever had this much fun at work in my entire career. Here's just a few photos of some of the great messes we made during our texture testing process. On the right here is a picture of some of the food trays. Uh, the, during the first few weeks we, we did our IDSI texture testing, we looked at about seven trays a day. Our wonderful food services department agreed to provide us with the entire 21 day menu cycle on, with each food offered at least twice for us to compare testing to make sure it was consistent. So it was our time then to squash, drip, and flick those foods and, and have a great deal of fun and mess while doing it. It's really not a difficult process. What you're going to want to do is take a look at the current foods and drinks you have on offer and classify the, your existing menu items into their IDSI levels. At this point, you may identify some gaps in your menu. For example, our old mince diet was very, very liberal and had items like scrambled eggs and toast. When it became a level five minced and moist diet, we had to find some other food options. Thankfully, our patient menu coordinator was a member of our team and came up with some really great solutions. Spreadsheets for your menu items are a simple way to organize your IDSI testing process. Here is an example of one that was kindly shared with us from the VA when they started their testing and mapping process. Here's an example of one of the documents that my team developed and shared with the registered dietitians, speech language pathologists, and food services groups. 
Since we only use commercially sourced products, we're able to maintain a list of foods by texture very easily that can be consulted with anyone involved with dysphagia. It's important to keep a few things in mind when you're mapping the foods and drinks. You need to assess your actual food and drinks, not a theoretical piece of lasagna or some brand of macaroni and cheese. You need to look at the actual foods you'll be serving in your actual organization and how they will actually be prepared and presented. You want to be very sensitive to how things like cooking times and temperatures can affect your foods. We tested all of our foods and drinks at our tray arrival temperature. So the hot things were hot and the cold things were cold. We also tested them again after 30 to 60 minutes to mimic um, a lot of real life scenarios we encounter every day. For instance, someone who was very, very slow to feed themselves or perhaps a delay in getting fed due to issues with tray distribution or waiting to be fed. Um, so that was one of the ways we assured that, that our texture mapping really did reflect our actual foods and drinks. And you may find that you have to be particularly sensitive to things like ripeness and cooking time, uh, especially for your fruits and vegetables. And you may also determine that there's some foods and drinks you want to look at at every serving occasion for tech considerations like particle size, softness, and flow. Maybe something like a soup on your menu that you want to be sure that it, if your, your intention that it is a mildly thick texture, that may be something you need to be verifying on every time it's prepared. Fortunately, though, the mapping the foods and drinks is easy, it's simple, quick to learn, easy to teach, cost effective. So that really isn't going to be a barrier for you if you do find you need to be verifying items frequently. What I love about this slide is how it reflects all of our experiences, particularly with fruit, that we know how much ripeness will affect the texture. Obviously, our green banana and our very, very, very soft brown banana are not going to have the same texture characteristics. So when we are recommending um, a texture for something with dysphagia, someone with dysphagia, we really need to verify that, that the food we're offering have those texture characteristics. When you map your foods and drinks, you may not find a lot of difference between some of the older categories and the idzy ones. So you may well be closer than you think. This is particularly true for many of the commercially prepared thickened liquids. And the slide is an example of a currency converter that shows how drinks map from the national dysphagia diet categories for liquids on the left to the IDSI framework for drinks on the right. One advantage of IDSI terminology compared to some of the other older labels is how much more descriptive it is. Terms like minced and moist or soft and bite-sized are very intuitive. You will soon find that you're pretty good at, at understanding and predicting how items will fall on the IDSI pyramids. And you will hopefully also find, as we did, that these terms are easily understood by persons with dysphagia and their caregivers. They're easily taught, they're very intuitive, they're very descriptive, they're very complete. It is truly amazing to me still, after all this time, that you can transition an entire menu to IDSI using a spoon, a fork, two syringes, and a stopwatch. Talk about practical. And if you're working within a cultural context where forks aren't commonly used, that's no problem at all. IDSI also provides testing methods using fingers and chopsticks. IDSI is truly an international and interculturally inclusive framework. Please see IDSI 101 and 201 presentations for a lot more detail on these texture testing methods, as well as the IDSI.org site and the IDSI, map, if, uh, the IDSI app if you'd like to know more. IDSI provides a series of audit tools that will walk you through the texture testing with ease. They contain a simple to follow grid of all the characteristics of a given texture. So it's very easy to see if a particular food or drink item is correctly mapped. These tools didn't exist when we did our own texture mapping and so we just kept a copy of the framework handy. But over time, I have so come to appreciate the very thorough library of resources that IDSI provides. You will find that you don't have to invent the wheel at a single phase of your IDSI implementation project. Instead, you just have to go and locate and download the exact perfect tool for whatever stage of implementation you are at. And I think these audit tools are such a great example of that. 
idsy.org also has um, many other useful tools. I love this complete summary of the whole texture testing system and um, diet texture system. It's something that is easy to print off that could be kept handy wherever you needed to consult it regularly. Uh, for me, one thing that's worked really well has been to gather the printouts of the framework, the audit sheets, and the handouts, which I've had spirally bound and I carry around with me, um, especially when I don't have easy access to a computer. It's something I can share with other team members, my patients, their family members, when I need a quick point of reference. I always pass a copy of this to my students and to any new colleagues who are joining our dysphagia team when I give them my very, very enthusiastic welcome to IDSI speech. The final stage of IDSI implementation is cl clinical communications. And again, IDSI has helped you out by providing a tremendous library of resources. Here are some examples of printable icons for all the sections of the IDSI pyramids. You may choose to use them to label your products, for instance. Uh, you can be highly consistent in all your labeling and your communication tools as Izzy has provided the exact colorways of, of all the colors on the pyramid so you can use them in your, your resource materials as well. There are official abbreviations of the Izzy diet textures and these were made in accordance with the Institute for Safe Medical Practices list of error prone abbreviations, symbols, and dose designations. We were absolutely thrilled when these were developed partway through our IDSI implementation process um, because we had been looking for a way to capture the IDSI diets on our tray tickets. And this is what it looked like in the end. Uh, as you'll see, these are examples of tray tickets from my organizations. You'll see um, in our bunch of abbreviations at the top there, we have the textures using the official IDSI abbreviations. We have found that these were very quick and easy for our food services staff and the whole team to pick up and to use. And at this point, we're all going around using the abbreviations when we talk about the IDSI diet. It's always this person's on SB6 or this person's on MT2 um, because we have really found them incredibly helpful and easy to use. This is an example of a communication tool that was shared with the patients at my hospital facility when we transitioned to the IDSI standard. Um, at that time, we had about 25% of our inpatient population on a modified texture diet and another 15% on a tube feed. So we always said we have about 40% of our inpatient population who's got complex swallowing needs. Um, which was certainly one of our big, big motivating factors for adopting IDSI. We found when we explained the benefits of IDSI to the people with dysphagia that we served and their families and caregiver, that there was a lot of buy-in. And what a positive message to give this very, very special and vulnerable population that you're adopting a best practice to optimize their well-being. The check mark symbol on the bottom right of our handout was from our patient and family advisory council. It gave everyone a great feeling to know we are championing the needs of our patients with dysphagia and they were certainly very, very enthusiastic supporters of the entire project. There's a great series of handouts available for you on the idsy.org site that can be shared with anyone on a dysphagia diet. They make it really simple for, for persons with dysphagia to know what types of foods are recommended, what to avoid, and how to assess if a given food or drink item is appropriate on a, a recommended diet texture. So here's a few final thoughts from my own IDSI implementation experience. Um, one, the first one was just to start. We had been hearing about IDSI through the grapevine, the early communications from, from the um, IDSI International Group, and were quite enthusiastic about it because of the many concerns we had with our existing diets. We started with just chatting amongst ourselves, um, th those sort of in the dietitian and speech pathology community. And as our enthusiasm grew, we realized that we were becoming those IDSI champions and that, that this was a project we wanted to pursue. Um, by sharing enthusiasm, we were quickly able to bring our food services department on board as they were also looking for ways to meet the, the best needs of our, our very special population. 
we, we, our main barrier partway through our process um, was that our medical record was delayed for so long. At first that seemed that maybe it would stop our IDSI transition, but what we, we came to realize in our team that mapping correctly our foods and drinks was the absolute most important aspect from a safety point of view. And so that even though we were stuck for many months still using our old terminology, soft and minced, we could feel confident that that diet was now a level five minced and moist diet and had those safety factors built in for our patients. So we did not let ourselves get up, held up by the barriers and certainly having a sense of how those, those other processes and systems around you work can help you troubleshoot those barriers, which is why you really are encouraged to form an IDSI team that will harness the expertise of, of all the sorts of players in your organization to make it happen. The um, final thing I always say is my, my little quip here, quip here about the minced chicken. Um, one of the unexpected delights of this project for me was the excuse to taste test every menu, um, any, every menu item we offered simultaneously with our texture testing. And it has been a real positive for me and, and the patients I serve. Um, to be able to speak confidently about the quality of the modified texture diets we are serving. Um, I know their appearance isn't always the same, but we really are trying to communicate to, to our patients with dysphagia that they are being offered a, a quality and a tasty product that's really been designed to meet their needs. Um, it's been a real positive that I can speak with respect and enthusiasm about the foods I'm, I'm recommending. Again, idzy.org has got a wealth of resources for you. Um, there's even resources that are designed to be country specific. And if you look under the tab for Canada, you'll, you'll see some of our, our recent communications. Many, many great handouts and tools available for your use. The IDSI YouTube channel will have videos of this uh, May 2020 webinar series, as well as useful videos such as all of our texture testing methods demonstrated. We have an app. It's free to download for iOS and Android and can keep IDSI at your fingertips wherever you go. This can be a great resource if you work in a community setting, for instance. You want more IDSI, we uh, distribute a monthly e-bite str straight to your inbox. So happy to have you today joining the Global IDSI Initiative, a truly international effort to promote best practices and best care for persons with dysphagia. Thanks to the amazing volunteer boards of directors who made it all happen. And speaking personally, and as this is the third in our Canadian webinar series, very proud to have such a strong Canadian presence on, on the board. Um, something we use as a selling point in our organization that not only is IDSI an international standard, it's also one that truly understands our Canadian or North American context as well. And we're very lucky this afternoon on our panel to have Peter Lamb, the international co-chair, who will be supporting me in answering your questions. So now I'm going to turn it over to you for, for your questions and feedback today and our other expert guests on our panel. Thank you so much. Safe swallowing. Ellen, thank you very much for that very comprehensive process on implementing ITSI. Uh, I know that you know, the ITSI office receives lots and lots of questions about how to do this. So I'm sure uh, this will be very useful for anyone who is watching this. Uh, so we already have some questions come through. And um, before that, I just want to remind everyone that the recording will be available, as Ellen mentioned, on our YouTube channel early next week. And that also by then you, you will have received a certificate of attendance um, in your inbox. If you're phoning in, which I can see we have about seven people doing so, please just shoot us an email to meetings at iddsi.org so that we can know who you are um, and then we can mail email you this certificate of attendance. Uh, we have upcoming webinars in Spanish, German, and Hebrew and the registrations uh, and details for those will be available on our website uh, shortly as well. Uh, I think that is that's all I have 
for notes. Oh, I am also going to share the link with everyone attending today uh, to sign up for our eBytes. So if you haven't already, uh, it'll take you two minutes to sign up. Uh, we won't spam you and we usually just email you uh, once a month and whenever there's any important notes or, or recordings uh, that make available to you, we'll make those available to you. Okay, that is all for me. So we have some questions come in. Uh, I'm going to welcome John and Sophie as well. Uh, hello, John. Hello, Sophie. And here we go. So we have a, the first question says, do you know of any public school systems, pre-K through 12, that have implemented the ITSI framework? And if so, are there resources, guidelines for school districts that are looking to implement ITSI? That is a fantastic question. I'm afraid my area of clinical practice has been adult medical. Um, do any of the other panelists have any experience with IDSI in the school systems? Helen, I'll be happy to jump in. It's Peter Lamb, co-chair of IDSI. Um, we do not actually um, keep track of, of who's implementing and, and who's not implementing. Um, may we invite the uh, participants on the call today. Um, for those who are aware of um, implementation uh, that is underway, uh, whether it's in the public school system, whether it's in uh, your organization, um, if you don't mind, send us a little note and tell us how things are going. Um, many of you may have received the ITSI eBite yesterday. Uh, we're asking people to let us know what's going on uh, in your part of the world. Uh, you can find the uh, share your story um, section on our website under the implementation tab or the implementation um, menu area. Um, and just send us a really quick note. Um, we would love to share your story with other people. So. Um, the question about public school system, um, unfortunately, we, we, we are not aware of any, but uh, we, we hope that it is happening there. And if you are part of that public school system and you are using ITSI, please let us know. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Next question. How did patients react to not being able to have bread on their level six soft and bite-sized diet? What did, you use a what did you use as a replacement for bread or did you just puree the bread? So I'll, it's Ellen here, I'll answer that. Um, on our level six soft and bite-sized diet, as well as the minced and moist diet and the pureed diet, we are offering a puree, series of pureed bread products, including pureed cakes and pureed muffins. Uh, some of them are extremely tasty and highly recommended. Um, certainly that bread, there are recipes for a gelled bread and I believe some of those resources are available on the IDSI site. Um, I think bread is often one of those things that, that does cause a lot of worry for people. We, we know from the research literature that it, it is a high risk item and it's been tragically associated with many episodes of choking. Um, if you're finding that bread is something that your person on a soft and bite-sized diet could safely tolerate. That would be part of your clinical assessment. Again, when we talked earlier about how the IDSI framework is descriptive, not prescriptive, it's there to describe the characteristics of the food and drinks that a person with dysphagia can tolerate. If you have done a clinical assessment and you have found that a person can tolerate that, then that is legitimately included in their diet. But you may also probably find in a case like that, that maybe the easy to chew diet is, is the right fit for that person with dysphagia. Uh, we're fortunate in our organization to offer quite a broad 21-day menu cycle with quite a variety of foods. So even though our, our people with our patients with dysphagia have lost some of those preferred items, we, we try to, you know, offer a diverse and high quality diet so that um, we can celebrate the foods and drinks they are allowed to safely tolerate versus those things that are now missing from their menu. Ellen, if you don't mind, I think I'll uh, add on to that comment uh, with regards to bread. The reason why bread is not included um, in those um, texture modified levels of uh, soft and bite size, uh, minced and pureed, we're talking about bread in its um, typical uh, 
serving form. So um, in the North American context, we typically think of bread as something that is soft, easy to break down. Um, but as we all know, there is a good variety of, of different types of bread out there. Um, some are softer, uh, easier to break down, um, and yet there are ones that um, are more whole grain, uh, have a higher uh, gluten content, uh, more elastic in nature. Those are much tougher to break down. Um, and then again, depending on the oral processing abilities of the individuals that you're supporting, um, do they actually have the ability to grind down and break down the bread without it being compressed into a solid bolus that would present um, a choking risk? And that's the reason why we keep emphasizing in all of our communications that um, providing any particular food in a particular textural level is really um the dependent on the clinician's discretion and so um as ellen had mentioned itsy serves to help us to be consistent in the way we identify a textural level not a diet per se um so what we used to be able to uh or what we used to say was oh so and so is on a minced diet so in the mince diet, um, these foods are all allowed. And what we found in our review of national diet uh, descriptors and even regional diet descriptors is that some of these do not work, as Ellen had mentioned in uh, her presentation earlier, because um, they could vary uh, so uh, much in terms of their behavior uh, when the food is, is being orally processed or in the way that they're uh, served. And so that's the reason why ITSI has specifically designed testing methods for everyone to be able to use. And it really doesn't matter what area of practice you are in or what uh, you know, area you are uh, supporting people in. Um, these testing methods can be used by anyone and um, we know that the testing methods may not appear to be very sophisticated, but um, again, as Ellen mentioned, we wanted to make sure that these testing methods are very simple, very easy to use, and very accessible to everyone without um, having to use expensive instruments. Um, and if you wanna know more about the uh, testing methods, um, John was kind enough to present uh, the ITSI 201 uh, webinar to us last week, and um, that webinar recording is available on our website, so please do check it out. Thank you, Peter. Next question. Did you use competencies to assess knowledge with kitchen staff or nursing before starting? Uh, Ellen here, we did not in our organization. Um, again, I think those considerations of what skills and what knowledge you're going to need are going to be very organization specific because we are relying on commercially prepared dysphagia products. Um, a lot of our um, decision making and, and, and knowledge was at our level of our sort of menu designers and purchasers. Um, but certainly, um, depending on how your, your, your setup, your distribution goes, um, that's true, There's, there may be a lot of different groups that need to have a lot a more in-depth understanding of, of the ITSI um, methodology and the, t the testing methods. And again, we're very fortunate that there are such a great library of resources available to you if you find that in your care setting, those are, are people that really need to intimately understand the model. Um, I had fun just the other day reviewing syringe drip testing with a few colleagues, so. It's true, it can be a broad base of, of people that you will be involving, but as I said, fortunately, um, it's quite easy to teach. Great, thank you, Ellen. Next question. How did you address soups? Uh, this person is saying they know some facilities that transition to only pureed soups for all ITSI levels of four to six because it can be a mixed texture 
this was done to make it easier for food service production and service, but they're worried about pushback. So certainly we have about three different categories of soups on our regular menu. We do have mixed consistency soups. So something like your minestrone, your, your chicken noodle, where you've got the thin liquid and the solid items. And those indeed would generally only be offered on our um, regular texture diet and depending on the characteristics of the little bits in them on our easy to chew diet. Um, we have which we call potage soup, which is very similar. Those are fully blended, so they can be quite thick. And we also serve some cream soups without pieces like a cream of chicken or a cream of mushroom that the ones we source don't have little lumpy bits in them. Um, so certainly, you know, we offer a variety of menu items to meet the needs of, of our, our varied population. Um, as we all know from our own experiences, we all eat every day foods that if from our dysphagia lens would be a modified texture um, item. If I make my children a blended um, sweet potato soup, it may well be the characteristics of a moderately thick item, but we're not on a dysphagia diet. It's just a normal food item for us. So I think when you consider items like soups, it may be a great opportunity to serve um, your population across the dysphagia uh, spectrum, a, a delicious food that, that meets everybody's needs. Great, thank you. Um, I have a couple questions here, re uh, very specific to implementation. So I'm gonna go to those first. Uh, do you have a list of equipment that you would recommend to purchase that will provide optimal results in achieving the desired textures? Um, they're saying they struggle with the consistency of their minced and pureed foods. Peter, would you like to address that? Sure, Ellen. Um, so in terms of um, the minced texture items, um, some sites have reported that uh, they've actually purchased uh, grinder plates that are of a uh, certain dimension to be able to allow for foods to um, achieve that four millimeter by four millimeter uh, or the two millimeter by two millimeter if you're working in a pediatric setting. Um, and um, so that, that's one that we've, we've heard that's been helpful. So these are, are grinder plates uh, that are attached to grinders uh, commercial grinders uh, or uh, to residential grinders. Uh, there are some that have the five millimeter um, openings that actually will grind down to a four millimeter uh, result. In terms of uh, pureed foods, um, a blender, uh, a food processor that have sharp blades tend to work well. Um, in consultation with um, a number of, of chef consultants who have provided input for us, um, many of them have indicated it really, really is helpful when you assess the product that you are starting with. And so it may be worthwhile actually taking a look at the preparation of uh, the food that is intended for texture modification and to think about how those may be prepared. And so here's an example. If we start out with something that has been cooked in a dry heat setting and we end up with crispy edges or dried uh, sort of, you know, sections on the top, um, then those may not uh, then texture modify very well because you now have uh, dried out uh, more stringy or elastic uh, bits to the food uh, compared to something that may have been cooked in a uh, moist environment um, at lower temperatures where you may not be uh, immediately shrinking the fibers of, of the food. So I think this is where um, it's really worthwhile working with the culinary experts, your cooks and your chefs, um, to talk about the process of how you would start uh, in preparing the food before you even modify the texture. Um, a lot of the chef consultants will um, also recommend that we look at the raw ingredients, uh, perhaps even just to start off with. 
you know, are we working with something that um, is very, very lean uh, versus something that maybe have a higher fat content to it? Um, are we working with, you know, uh, foods that are, or, you know, fruits and vegetables that are, um, you know, more tender and don't uh, have as many fibers in it or skins and peels? Um, and so all of those things would be worthwhile um, discussing uh, during the whole sort of testing method uh, and trying to determine how to be able to achieve uh, the textural levels that you're looking for. Great, thank you, Peter. Um, someone is asking how long it took for you, Alan, to map your foods and drinks. And after mapping, did you then change or modify the recipes to taste better and meet the appropriate texture? So we did our food and drink mapping over about a couple of months. Um, as I said we, earlier, we didn't have any dedicated time for our project. So how we arranged it, we run a 21 day menu cycle here. Um, so we tested Sunday's items on Mondays as well as Monday's items and Saturday's items on Friday together with the Friday items. So it was about three weeks to do an initial pass. Um, and then cycling back on items that we wanted to be sure we saw everything at least twice. So items that we wanted to see again or had missed the first time. So it took probably a couple of months for us, not a huge amount of time. I think on our first days when we were at seven trays, taking us about an hour because we were constantly flipping back and forth in the IDSI framework. As we went along, we could identify you know, an individual item within 10 seconds, really that quickly. If you're doing a fork test or um, a drip test or whatever else, very, very quick. Um, we are commercially sourcing all of our foods and drinks. So we weren't modifying particular menu items, but we did have gaps created in our menu when we switched to IDSI. One particular example was the breakfast um, items on our formerly minced diet, now IDSI level five minced and moist. Um, and our former diet, as I said, was very, very liberal. So we had omelets and we had toast and we had all sorts of items that obviously were not going to be compliant. And our solution ultimately was to source um, a, a much broader range of primarily pureed products. So currently our minced and moist and our pureed breakfasts are quite similar um, in most of the items, but because we now had a larger population on those items, we were able to justify sourcing a larger and richer range of items. So we have added um, pureed eggs, we've added some pureed ham and sausage to that item, um, some different pureed muffins. Um, so that was one solution for us. We've also had fun with sauces over the years. Um, often an item, and for all of us, and, and, and those of us who are not on modified textures do this ourselves. You have your chicken with your, your gravy, but you could also have it with a sweet and sour sauce or a barbecue sauce or a, a more of a tomato flavor sauce. So that's one thing that, that our, our dietary office has been very, very good at is seeking to create you know, a diverse and pleasurable range of food items um, while being very respectful of the diet textures. Great, thank you, Ellen. I think we have time for one more question uh, and I save this to last. Uh, the question is, how do you handle a food item that changes consistency after 60 minutes, like soups and jellies? Do you eliminate them from the diet or change the preparation method? Oh, what a fantastic question. <laughs> and this certainly is when we spoke earlier about the importance of testing your actual foods under your actual serving conditions. What a great example of this. Um, we tested, for instance, um, the things we know change textures are our hot soups got thicker as they cooled and our cold supplements, dietary supplements, tend to got thinner as they warmed up. So we made a point of testing them at sort of optimal temperature and sort of worst case scenario or realistic temperature. Um, if it was a slight variation when we did our classification, we, we classified them at the sort of higher risk items. So for instance, if, if an item started as a um, level 
three and then became a level two, we classified it as a level three, um, just sort of thinking on, on the risk factor profiles of our, of our patients with dysphagia. Um, and it's certainly something you have to be sensitive to if you really find that a food item changes so radically that it's no longer safe, it, it may be important to eliminate it from your menu. You may also need to consider ways to bring an item back to the consistency you want. Our classic example of mashed potatoes, which can start as, as a very moist and um, not gummy item. And maybe after 45 minutes of sitting out on the tray, they've congealed and now they're, they're very, very sticky. And you may find that as you go along, you need to be refreshing food items. Um, your potatoes have evaporated liquid and maybe you need to be adding a little bit of hot water or hot broth back into them to refresh them. So absolutely very, very important to consider um, how food and drink items do change over time and as they're sitting out. And certainly also just as how they're being heated up. Um, we found over the years that, you know, certain we, items heated up in isolation are very dry and they're heated up on the tray with other things that they are the right texture. And those are important considerations as we design our menus. Anybody else? Ellen, I'll just add on to that by saying that um, there are some organizations that actually have been working uh, very hard to uh, revisit the proportions in their recipes and um, what they're looking at is, you know, what does what the finished product look like at the time of production versus um, plating versus uh, when it actually arrives at the table uh, or at the bed uh, for the individual. So what they did was then um, went back and revisited what they needed to do in order to achieve an optimal product at the time of service. So um, the example of mashed potatoes, they may end up with something that is um, actually more um, moist than what might be desired at the time of, of holding and plating um, so that when it actually arrives at uh, service, it could be that ideal uh, textural behavior. Uh, so that, that's one example of, of what some people are doing. Um, the other one really is um, then to launch into a discussion about when you see a product do this over the course of time, um, what are some things that we can do? And that um, has happened at an operational level. Uh, do we reheat the food? Do we add more uh, moisture to it? Um, do we uh, look at serving uh, smaller portions to start, uh, recognizing that we might want to then, you know, uh, add a fresh portion at some other point in the meal? Again, all of this would depend on your abilities um, and your the resources available to your organization and operation. Um, but these are the things that people have said have been helpful from an implementation perspective. Um, and so again, we invite the audience, if you've got some good tips to be able to share with the global community, um, we're all in this together and we would love to hear what you're doing uh, and to be able to share this with um, other ITSI implementers around the world. Thank you, Peter. We are now past the top of the hour, so we are going to leave it there. If we didn't get to your question, keep an eye out on future eBytes uh, or newsletters where we will try to address uh, your questions. So that marks the end of this webinar. And if you know of anyone who benefit from listening to the recording of this session, uh, please do share, them, uh, share it with them once it is available early next week. Uh, thank you to John uh, Hallahan, Sophie Palmer, Peter Lamb uh, for joining us as guest panelists. And of course, thank you to Ellen Andrews uh, for a very informative uh, presentation. So, and of course, thank you to the listeners for joining us today. We hope that you found this information useful in your practice. We are signing off. Have a great weekend. And until next time, thank you, everybody. <laughs>